Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, February 1st, 2020. It's a weekly market update. So, the first thing I want to get into a little bit was just to show the carnage in some of the markets that we're interested in due to the more of a perception, I would say, than actual effect of the coronavirus and what the effects are going to be in China and around the world as the World Health Organization has now said that this is an epidemic. But I try to look at the facts. I'm not convinced this is the Spanish flu of 1918 or 1919 whenever it was, or 1920, I think, is, I think it's the 100-year anniversary. I don't think we're going to have millions of deaths. Uh, we've had all kinds of um, misinformation or made-up information. I mean, the Zero Hedge got banned from Twitter yesterday for saying that this was virus was a manufactured bioweapon because it had different components from the HIV virus on it. I mean, who knows? Bottom line is... If you look at the symptoms and what really happens, this is, like I said before, somewhere between a flu virus, like influenza, and the SARS virus, somewhere in between it's going to fall. It seems to be highly infectious, and it does kill off the weak, uh, people with diabetes, older people, uh, people, people that are immune compromised. So we're seeing more and more Flight cancellations, several airlines now have canceled flights to China, or back from China, American, United, uh, Chinese airlines. People aren't going to be flying. Uh, that's going to reduce consumption internally, what's going on with the quarantines that are happening in China. So basically, we can't quantify. So this is what happens. You have initial sell-off. Your algos and AI sees this. You bring in the market perception and fear, and this thing just sells off oil. You know, it's like, you know, our thesis, I think, was correct. From this, You know, we thought that uh, with all the money printing going on, which does continue, that we would see a rise in commodity prices. That was an effect, and all of a sudden we had this black swan. Now, we're seeing the same thing in copper. Copper's really imploded if you will it's down quite a bit they call copper dr copper because it predicts they say it predicts economic growth or the economic conditions you can uh, see in the future based on the because copper is so ubiquitous in every facet of the economy i guess my perception of this whole thing is this this is going to have an effect on commodity demand it's going to have an effect on economics we don't know what the effect will be we don't know the amount of damage lost production we don't know if this virus is going to spread to every country on the world and really have worst case predictions come true so what i'm doing is you know i have position sizing in my portfolio i'm never all in on one idea and so i'm not really that worried about what's going on because eventually this thing's going to crest. It's going to be like regular flu. It's going to crest and go away or recede into the, and it won't be newsworthy anymore. And then fundamentals will reassert themselves. Now, in previous episodes, this has taken anywhere from um, six months to a year, three months to a year. So we don't really know. So <clears throat> when you see a chart like this, you don't. You put your names together of things that you want to buy, but you don't do anything. You don't try to catch a falling knife. There's no reason for us to do anything except for wait, see what happens, and if these prices turn, then we can just come in and shoot these things in the back. We don't have to, uh, you know, be heroes and, and get in front of this. We can wait for the turn, wait for the trend to reverse, and we can have our names available, and then we can go in and bargain hunt. Now, I would like to say... I have got some emails and some comments. It's like, well, it's all you care about. You guys just talking about this. Well, this is a trading, investing, and economics type discussion video series channel. This is not uh, this is not a philosophical or religious channel. This is not a uh, 
biology channel. This is not an epidemic channel. You know, this is not something that we know about. As I've said before, you know, if you look at the CDC, just regular flu season, anywhere from 12 to 60,000 people die in the United States every year from the regular flu. No one cares. You know, there's how many car accidents were there last night because of people driving under the influence and people died. No one cares. So it's like the media likes to hype things up, likes to put it into your frontal lobe. I don't watch TV. I don't have cable. I don't watch the cable news. I don't really know what they're hyping. You know, I remember when they have hurricanes and, you know, you see the people in the back supposedly sitting in a John boat. And then off to the side, you see a guy walking in ankle deep water. That's the press for you. So I don't get excited. I don't freak out because I've seen it all before. I've seen Y2K. Nothing happened. I've seen SARS. I've seen MERS. I've seen HIV. It was going to, you know, infest the, uh, because of blood transfusions into the heterosexual community. I've seen all these end of the world scenarios. And they don't ever happen. Now, this might be it. I don't know. I don't think it is. That's how I'm betting on it. And, you know, ankle biters and gamma males that, you know, that's all you people care about on this channel. Well, what do you think this channel is about? I mean, uh, moral preening is not what we're into in virtue signaling here. Reality is what it is, not what I want it to be. And, uh, you know, we are invested in spe in markets we're speculators we have to try to game these things out they have to be discussed uh and some people find that distasteful evidently this channel's probably not for them conversely gold has been acting as a safe haven gold and of course bonds everybody flees to u.s government securities in times of un uncertainty and gold is performing nicely now i suspect when this thing dies down I mean, gold's overbought. I suggested it would probably consolidate or go down. It's going to be the same thing when the, with oil and copper. They're going to find a bottom. The news will peak out on this newest end of the world scenario. When it doesn't materialize, these things will recover. The other thing I wanted to point out when you think about this is the fact that one of the theses I've had is that world central banks are in this massive uh, liquidity driven pump mode where just about every central bank around the world is cutting rates or pumping liquidity into their economies this is good for for resource markets in my view they create trillions and trillions of currency units you have a fixed amount of commodities or commodities can't be increased as quickly as monetary currency units can Therefore, we speculated that we would see higher prices, and that's in fact what we have, begin, have begun to see until we had this black swan event. So, I would posit that if economies in China, the U.S., or different places around the world are negatively affected by this virus, if you will, to the point where it's becoming material, I would suggest to you that I mean, with the central banks already having their foot on the gas accelerator to the floor, they're going to hit the nitro, uh, nitrous oxide and really ramp up the liquidity. I think we can expect that. So I think when we do come out of this thing, which I forecast we will, uh, that the bounce back will be pretty tremendous. So it's not going to happen in a week or two. There's a lot of technical damage been done to these markets. There's a lot of emotions and perceptions now. There's a lot of fear and panic. Those are not good. They're not, those things are not f fixed or rectified in a day or two or a week or two. But once the new cycle turns, the next crisis du jour will materialize and the focus will come off of this coronavirus and go to whatever the news media feels uh, is going to get them the most eyeballs. So, uh, having said that, I uh, wanted to point this out, got this off Twitter, Charlie Belio's Twitter feed. I think I've shown this before, but right now you have uh, energy stocks, as represented by the XLE, are now at the lowest point in history relative to the Standard & Poor's 500. I think that's relevant because we've seen in the past week... Companies like Tesla, 
Amazon, Apple, uh, making new all-time highs. With respect to Apple, I mean, their actual performance of the company was actually down. It wasn't uh, up year over year. And Tesla, well, that's just a mess, and it's making all-time highs. So this liquidity-driven uh market if you will is making new highs we we've said that that's what we think is going to happen we're going to have a blow off top uh, i don't know how much will be affected by this black swan of this coronavirus but uh you know what i'm looking at is i'm looking for things that are valued and i'm looking to sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation and i would say that energy now is one of the most despised uh underloved undervalued segments of the market and what's Amusing to me, I find amusing, and I'm going to show in a minute a slide that reinforces this, is the fact that energy enables every facet of your life, and yet it's being treated like, you know, it's the new plague. No one wants to invest in it. There's going to be divestitures. You know, I'm talking about old line um, uh, energy stocks like oil and gas, coal, things like that, uranium. Uh, because everything's going to be windmills, solar panels, and, you know, Fruit Loops and free ice cream for the kids. And I don't see it that way. So we go through these periods of undervaluation and overvaluation. Uh, there are cycles. You can see in the previous cycle where energy was overvalued in, a, in with respect to the S&P. You can see that these are decade type moves. I mean, 1999 to 2009, and then subsequently the fall off. It's going on for 11 years now, 10 or 11 years. And we pointed this out before. This is not just specific to oil. It's the whole commodity complex is at generational lows in valuation relative to stocks. And stocks are just going higher because of liquidity pump. And I will show a chart about that later that emphasizes that. I'll put a link to this video. He was on CNBC the other day. I guess some of the big major oil companies like Shell, and Chevron, Exxon, their earnings haven't been very good lately. So here's what he said on Friday on CNBC. Jim Cramer, who is the one of the best, besides Dennis Gartman, Jim Cramer is probably one of the best reverse barometers you can have. What do I mean by reverse barometer? This guy has never been right about anything ever. And all the schlubs... Bleacher bums, watch his show, buy, buy, buy. You know, grilled cheese sandwiches are going up, buy, buy, buy. I mean, this guy's just a, it's just ridiculous. So here's what he says. Oil stocks are in the death knell phase. You're seeing divestiture by a lot of different funds. It's going to be a parade. It's going to be a parade that says, look, these stocks are tobacco and we're not going to own them. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's, a, that's an assertion. That's a statement. But is it true? I would suggest it's not. Why? Well, uh, with respect to the majors, oil majors, that could be the case, but there are different facets and areas of the energy market which are substantially undervalued and which I believe will recover. And I think the surprise is going to be to the upside. I think this is another one of the bottom indicators. What Jim Cramer fails to tell you or doesn't know, and he's supposed to be this guy that knows everything about a thousand stocks by memory and he follows all these companies. With tobacco stocks, and I never owned them, I considered doing it, but I just couldn't get past the fact that 400,000 people a year die from smoking related uh, uh, diseases. I just couldn't get myself to do it. They were the best performing stocks over the last couple decades, even with all the problems ahead. Declining, raise, rising taxes by these states to try to try to get consumption to go down, which it did. They were sued and had a multi-billion dollar settlement with the states, okay? And yet, they were the, some of the best performing stocks and nobody wanted them. He's right. It's going to be a parade. The, the, we're not going to own them. Well, a lot of people did own them. And their dividends went up. And their stock prices went up, and they bought back a lot of stock. And why? Because they were able to raise prices, and they were able to uh, compensate for even all the damage that was done to them by the government and regulators. So, you know, we still have we, we're, we're moving into this view, which I find increasingly humorous. 
You know, we use 100 billion or 100 million barrels a day of oil. I've said this before. You guys know this. You've heard me say it before. I'll just repeat it for anybody that's new here. Use 100 million barrels a day of oil. Only half of that is used for transportation. The rest is used for all those products that you look around in your where you're sitting right now. All those plastics, paints, dyes, medicines, asphalt, roofing shingles. I mean, I could go on for hours. And oil's not going anywhere. It enables civilization. Uh, energy transitions take decades when they do happen. And even if we had a... Uh, had a concerted effort to go to full renewables, the oil consumption is not going down. Because why? Because the growth is not in the West. The West, the OECD, Western countries, Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Japan, are old, fat, and in decline. They are not going to be relevant over the next 20, 40, 50 years. That's just the facts. The consumption is going to be in Asia, in India, China, Indonesia, the Philippines, places Bangladesh, Africa. Why? Because fossil fuels will allow economic development, urbanization, clean water, refrigeration, air conditioning. Okay? So a bunch of whacked out people in the West that think that, you know, CO2 is a pollutant are not going to be relevant over time. In the short term, yes. You know, there's countries like Denmark and Norway, they're forcing, the Netherlands, they're going to force electric vehicles onto their streets. They're going to mandate these things, okay? So they're going to happen. But that doesn't mean it's going to be economic. And if you're in Bangladesh and you start getting close to being the middle class, and you buy a Kia or something, you're not going to just put it in your garage. You're going to drive it. And as these people become wealthier, they're going to, you know, travel more. I mean, it's just, you can just, we've had these discussions before. And, you know, with the underinvestment that's happened, I'm, mark my words, if he's still alive in three to five years, I don't know, he's getting up there in age, he probably will be, he's going to be telling you to buy oil stocks in, in a few years when the oil price is, you know, 100 or $120 a barrel. Because that's where it's going. Because there's been a lack of investment in non-shale production. For example, we use 100 million barrels a day, that's 36 billion barrels a year, we only found four, four billion barrels last year of new oil. That's consistent with what's been happening over the last 10 to 15 years. We've been using more oil than we're finding. So I think that, yes, there are a lot of new millennial and Generation X money managers out there who believe that CO2 is... Uh, is a pollutant and not the life-giving gas it is. You know, photosynthesis requires CO2. Photosynthesis is the process that plants use to synthesize. They take in carbon dioxide uh, and water, and sunlight is the catalyst then for the photosynthesis process, which creates plant growth, which enables animal life on the planet. To suggest CO2 is a pollutant is, I don't, I don't even know how to address that. That's just beyond ignorance. It just shows you the level of indoctrination that that entire generation has been marinated it in since kindergarten. And like I've said, I have no doubt. I mean, we're seeing it in Norway. The sovereign wealth fund that was built on oil and gas production, trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund of Norway, uh, which is only exists because of oil and gas, is divesting itself of many uh, oil and gas stocks. So they can do that. Uh, that's fine. I would suggest to you that uh, uh, people that uh, are going to be missing out on some big returns. But I thought this was interesting to point out. This other quote is from Larry Fink. Uh, I think he's from BlackRock. You know, he says, in the near future and sooner than most anticipate, there will be a significant reallocation of capital driven by climate factors, said Fink, founder of the firm that now manages nearly $7 trillion in assets. Well, I believe that. I believe in the West that the masters of the universe that meet in Davos, these uh, criminal bankers, yes, I believe that they're going to force 
via politics force us to you know go to less dense energy sources and you know do like they're doing in germany spend a half a trillion dollars and watch their co2 emissions step not go down and their coal use go up along with their power uh, costs yeah i have no doubt and then they're all gonna all gonna cream off a percentage that's what this is all about you think larry fink cares if co2 emissions go up or not or he even thinks that CO2 emissions, have, he doesn't. He knows it doesn't have anything to do with it. He sees an opportunity, $7 trillion. If the governments can uh, are going to go and spend trillions and trillions of dollars building less dense energy sources and forcing everybody into higher cost, less reliable electricity, he wants to, get a, 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 he wants to cream off a percentage for himself and his, and his firm. That, that's the whole basis of politics in the West and in these, in these uh, democracies that are controlled by the elites. You think that your votes actually matters? It doesn't. You think you're going to drain the swamp? You think when Bernie gets in there, he's going to implement all these things that he's said he's going to implement? No, he's not. He's not going to implement anything. You see what they did to, to, to Trump when he was going to drain the swamp? Do the same thing? To, yeah, you do some things around the edges to keep the uh, hoi polloi uh, satisfied the base but in the end hey it's not about uh, a clean environment it's about hey i got seven trillion dollars here and uh if you're going to go and build trillions and trillions of dollars of renewables i want to cream some of that off hey i'm in on it i'm with you i get it i see how it works but if you think oil is going away anytime soon you're, you're more you're you're naive it's not <laughs> wanted to talk about this um we talk about stock overvaluation, which you talked about earlier in the uh, video. The red line is corporate profits. Okay. The green line is the S&P 500 index. As you can see, as Larry Kudlow has says many times, one of the few things I agree with him on, corporate profits are the mother's milk of the stock market. So... You can have periods where stock prices go up and 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 disengage from corporate profits. This was uh, in the late 90s when we had the the uh, bust in the tech sector, and we had a bunch of liquidity uh, being put into the market by the Bernanke Fed or the Greenspan Fed. And you see that uh, you know even though corporate profits went down stock market went up okay and that was because of liquidity and then it gets back on track and it was kind of tracking and then you know you had the great financial crisis corporate profits plunged so did the stock prices and then you had the pumps turned on again liquidity pumps and look what's happened ever since we've been in this liquidity but look what's happened to stock uh to corp stock co corporate profits have stagnated yet stock prices are are way overvalued. They're way out of sync with corporate profits. We, that's something we haven't seen. I ask you to look at this chart, study it. I mean, shut off, put it on pause, look at it. Do you think this time's different? Do you think that one of two things is going to happen? Either corporate profits are in for a huge move higher, highly unlikely, or stock prices are going to regress to the mean and get back in sync with corporate profits what do you think is more likely i would suggest to you that's probably what is more likely is that stock prices are setting up for a big plunge at some point in the future now i'm not predicting it's going to happen i like i said i thought the catalyst for this turn in getting away from this liquidity pump would be higher oil prices but it looks like the SARS virus has put a dent in that thesis. And now, if you're going to affect economic growth, and SARS is going to be a big issue for all these economies, which it appears it could be, do you think that the central banks are going to let up on the liquidity? No, I suggest they're going to accelerate and pump even more. You could have even, this thing could go parabolic. It's on the verge of doing that anyways over the last couple of years. So we're in for a big readjustment here. Like I said, my indicators are not showing anything yet. I watch the high yield bond market because those are the most 
the weakest, most susceptible to feeling economic pressure type companies, everything's fine there. Uh, no indications of any issues yet. But I would suggest to you that this time is not different, that every time that we've gotten away from the uh, when corporate profits and stock prices have diverged, stock prices have always corrected. I suggest that's what's going to happen. I do not see 11 years into an economic expansion, corporate profits zooming higher now with the capacity constraints that exist in the economy around labor and, and, and other things. So this is something to really pay attention to. You know, if you're in a 401k with your money just in a, sitting in an S&P index fund, I don't know, I have a lot of my money in cash, with, except for the specific situations that we're speculating in. And those are speculations. They're not long-term investments. Let me say that again. With the exception of the speculations like uranium, offshore oil, shipping, certain parts of shipping, which are getting hammered also because of this virus scare. I mean, most of my, I have a lot of money in cash and I have a lot of gold because this is a problem and it's going to either, like I said, reconcile itself by stock prices coming down or corporate profits going up. And I would suggest to you that it's going to be stock prices. Let's talk a little bit of uranium news of note. I saw that, uh, Governor Mark Gordon of Wyoming, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> announced Friday morning that President Donald Trump placed $150 million in his upcoming budget for the purchase of domestic uranium to replenish military supplies. I thought that was interesting. I don't think that's market moving news, but it's just another bit of information of positive news uh, that uh, we're seeing. You know, the, the Trump administration is very pro nuclear. Uh, I don't think that they're done doing all the things that they're going to do to try to be uh, generous to the nuclear industry in the U.S. I think uh, President Trump sees the value there. Uh, I don't think he's a big fan of renewables, but, uh, you know, we got an election coming up and maybe we'll see some things change after this upcoming election. Another thing I wanted to point out, the uranium ETF URA, which is not really a pure play uranium ETF, dumped a bunch of st smaller uranium stocks over the last week or so, so they could buy uh, Kaz Adamprom stock. Uh, this really drove down a lot of uranium stocks uh, across the board because there's just rampant selling of an already depressed market where there's not a lot of liquidity, there's not a lot of buyers. So. Because of the fact that I'm, I, I don't really talk about uranium a lot because there's not really much to talk about. It's just a matter of sitting and waiting. Now all the fundamentals are pointing in the right direction. They're all bullish, so there's really nothing to do but sit around. But when you are presented with an opportunity, we're forced selling. You know, nothing inherently changed in any of these stocks except for the fact that there was forced selling from a big holder that drove artificially drove the price down. So I think you have to be in there buying those stocks the ones you like at least. And if you're not, then you don't understand the fundamentals. You shouldn't be in the market at all. Now, there's a lot of people on Twitter going back and forth, but it's, it's real simple. The fundamentals didn't change. It's forced selling into a illiquid market, forcing prices down. Well, I'm in, I'm in there buying. I look for days like that. You know, it's like I pointed out in the last video. I mean, I didn't look at it recently, but this week, but last week, I mean, even uranium participation, the net asset value, was lower than the stock or uh, higher than the stock price. So you could buy at a discount. Why wouldn't you want to buy physical uranium at a discount to its its value? Even if it's, you know, 93 cents on the dollar. And people, you know, I'll, I'll get emails from people and I've gotten emails and comments this week. It's like, you know, are you still in uranium? Well, when's it going to, I have no idea when it's going to turn. I've told you this before. I have no, I have absolutely no clue. I do not know. No one does. I do know that all the fundamentals are all the fundamentals are going in the right direction. You just have to sit and wait. And when you're presented with an opportunity, this is how money's made. Now I'm going to point out this educational segment I'm going to do after this of the difference between successful speculators and investors and people that are unsuccessful. And, I, and don't take offense to this. This is not a cut down because I used to be in this same boat as most of you guys. Most of you guys are not successful because you cannot control your emotions. Let me say that again. You're unable to control your emotions. 
have you written if you're involved in uranium stocks and you're emailing me about your angst about the stocks not moving to the green on your timetable do you understand why you own uranium stocks can you in 90 seconds give the thesis the elevator pitch of why you're in uranium stocks have you written it down do you check those premises occasionally when you get nervous and, and get full of angst were you buying last week when the prices were down this is Howard Marks I think you should read everything he says he's very smart his memos they are publicly available his books that he's written most important things this is what he's talking about this is what I'm talking about and this is something that I didn't originally have like most of you guys but I trained myself with age and wisdom and many losses in the markets but let me read this and then I'll go over it when the echo this is this is how things work in real life with most people most investors and speculators when the economic news is good, everything on MSNBC is favorable. The newspapers only report the good news. Most stories can be given a positive spin. The companies are performing stock. The companies are performing. Stock prices are rising. Stock prices make people feel good. People feel optimistic. Their fears are abating. Their eagerness is rising, and they're buying. So what do people do? People buy when stocks are going up. They feel good. They feel positive. The herd is with them. They're running with the herd. Jim Cramer's on there, buy, 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 making new highs, everything self-reinforcing, all the synapses in your brain are going in the right direction, popping, giving you those endorphin rushes, okay, because there's chemicals involved here too in your brain, you're getting, your pleasure centers are being hit, you're feeling good, you're feeling on top of the world, okay, that's, that's how most people do this that's when they're buying when prices are already up and everybody everything's going in the right direction conversely when prices are going down when all the news is bad when there's been years and years of no movement in stock prices except for grinding grinding down like between two grinding stones you're caught between you feel that way you buy and then the stock that you bought goes down 30%, but the fundamentals haven't changed. You have a sick feeling in your stomach. That's when people sell. This is, you know, it's childlike in its simplicity. Buy low, sell high. Like I said, everybody understands it. Few can do it. Why? Because they don't have emotional control. Let's see what Howard Marks says about it. One of the things that they he's talking about they being successful investors have in common is they're not emotional not being very emotional is very useful in the investing world there are worlds in which it's not a good thing like in a marriage but the truth of the matter is that it's very helpful to be either unemotional or to have the ability to control your emotions have the ability to control your emotions have the ability to control your emotions I had to learn this I was like a lot of you young guys a lot of people that are emailing me what am I gonna do what's happening well nothing you're gonna sit and wait that's what you're gonna do and look for opportunities to add to your position such that uh, when the thing does turn that you, you have a, a, enough of a position that it will be material and compensate you for your waiting that's the whole plan here you know you just don't buy a thousand dollars worth of a uranium stock that goes down 50 percent and then go well you know uh, uh the visions of sugar plums if the thesis is still correct which it is supply is down demand is up there's no new investment in mines they're building more reactors we're seeing you know we're seeing everything's the winds in our sails it's just a matter of waiting then and sitting around rubbing your hands about wondering what you know what the Japanese are doing with two or three million pounds are they selling it into the market is uh, you know is Kaz Adam prom you know gonna flood the market when if uranium goes to 40 all these ridiculous comments that are made guys commodity markets work the same always low prices cure low prices high prices cure high prices 
Okay, and these things are cyclical and they take years. There's the cyclicality, and that's why they're so powerful once they get moving, these trends. I just showed you in that oil chart. The uptrend and the downtrend, they're, de they're decade long. The same thing is true in uranium or just about every commodity. They're multiple year phenomenons on the downside and the upside. Now, I'm not going to lie and say that the expectation wasn't that we would have already turned, turned the corner on uranium. It is. But the, the, every day that goes by, more, more reactors are burning up more fuel and there's no new mines coming online. There are no mines coming online, but there are new reactors coming on every week, almost every week. So controlling emotions and understanding cyclicality, this is the key. And when this thing does turn, generational wealth can be created if it's done correctly. You know, if some of these stocks go up 10 or 10 times and you've had to sit and wait five years, you're, that's you you will be compensated and if you were able to buy quality assets that weren't getting diluted away so that when this thing does turn you get compensated you get paid off you know that's how it was in poker that's one thing i hated about it i mean i was very good at playing poker against people because people were impatient and they didn't play correctly but i had to i'd have to fold sometimes 20 30 hands so i got to a hand that was worth playing that i was in the correct position to play and even then, sometimes I didn't, you know, get paid off. But a lot of times I did get paid off handsomely. Then you have to sit and grind out another 20, 30 hands and wait for another decent hand to come around. That's just, that's just the nature of this game. So that's it for this week. Uh, went a little bit long, but uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the comments. Please hit the like, share this, comment. It helps out the algorithm. And uh, we definitely appreciate it. Uh, the channel continues to grow. This is, uh, you know, this interaction is just not me out in the woods screaming at, at, at the, in the air. Uh, you guys listen, and I do appreciate it. So uh, we'll talk to you next week. Take care.